My name is Dr. Fazia Zishan Khan, and today we will discuss about the obstructive uropathy, in which we will talk about the prostate. We all know that uh, the prostate is a retroperitoneal gland, and it weighs about twenty uh, grams, and it has got no distinct capsule, and it has uh, uh, got its particular anatomy. So, in this uh, talk, we will um, discuss about the causes of prostatitis, pathogenesis of prostatitis, management of prostatitis, and the clinical course of prostatitis. So, uh, first, uh, uh, first of all, we will look for the uh, anatomy of the normal prostate gland and what happens when prostatitis occurs. So, in this. Uh, in this picture, we can see that uh, this is the bladder, and the this is the prostate gland. The prostate gland basically it in, it circles the urethra, and it is retroperitoneal gland that it is not uh, covered by the peritoneum. The weight is twenty uh, grams, and it has been divided into four lobes and four zones. The anatomical distribution of lobes and zone is very important because uh, through this uh, anatomical distribution, we can identify any pathology that is associated with the prostate. So you can see this is the normal prostate and prostatitis. What happens when the prostate becomes enlarged? So the size is uh, a bit larger, and total prostate is hypertrophied. That it is, you can say that twenty times or hundred times or sometimes fifty times greater than its original uh, size or weight. So before going into details, we should know the anatomical structures, uh, where it is located, and what is the weight, and what are the different divisions. So when we talk about the division in lobes, it is divided into anterior lobe, lateral lobe. Posterior and median lobe. There are two anterior lobes, and when we talk about the zones, these are the transitional zones, peripheral zones, periurethral zones, and the central zones. So you can well uh, understand through this picture that this is the bladder, and this is the urethra. This is the ejaculate uh, ejaculatory duct that is uh, attached with this uh, urethra. This is the distal urethral opening. These are the uh, different zones. That is the peripheral zone. This is the periurethral zone. This is the central zone. This is the anterior fibromuscular stroma. So you should have a basic concept of the anatomy of the prostate before going into the detail. So now we move towards the pathology. On pathology, in pathological basis, we have divided into three uh, important uh, conditions. One is inflammation, then the tumors, and the hyperplasia. So we divided the pathology of prostate into inflammation, uh, inflammatory conditions, tumors, and the hyperplasia. When we talk about uh, the um, inflammatory conditions, we have further divided into four types. That is uh, acute bacterial prostatitis, and then um, chronic bacterial prostatitis, a bacterial prostatitis, and gr granulomatous prostatitis. So, what is this acute bacterial prostatitis? In acute bacterial pro prostatitis, there is a diffuse inflammation, and usually, as we as the name suggests, that it is bacterial prostatitis. Prostatitis. So, there are certain bacteria which are associated with, like E. coli, Enterococci, and Staphylococci. They basically um, uh, the clinical features are usually the patient complains of high grade fever, uh, dysuria, that is pain in urination, tenderness uh, when on the rectal examination. And what are the uh, diagnosis, best diagnosis to rule out this um, um, bacterial prostatitis is urine culture. So, but the important thing is that uh, why, how this uh, bacterial prostatitis um, occurs, it is due to urinary uh, uh, flow obstruction 
there is a urinary reflux as we have started in my last class that in case of uh, pyelonephritis what is what happens that there is a back pressure similarly if the obstruction is at the level of urethra so uh, there is a urinary reflux then there could be some surgical implantation that introduces the entry of any pathogen or bacteria catheterization catheterization is one of the most important route that introduces inf uh, infection in the urinary tract system as well as in the prostate then any um, urethral dilatation or any resection procedures and it also spreads through the lymphohematogenesis route so all these are the different um, routes that are responsible for introducing infection. When we talk about the chronic bacterial prostitis, it means that the patient uh, will come with a suprapubic pain, dysuria, and continuous low back pain. As it, the name suggests that it's a chronic condition. So the pathology associated with this chronic bacterial prostitis is not uh, uh, acute. It is associated for a long time. Like if a person is having recurrent urinary tract infections or sometimes a person is um, urinary, having a urinary tract infections but it is asymptomatic so there is a continuous um, you can say that uh, accumulation of the bacteria the causative organisms are um, e coli um, gram positive bacteria like uh, staph aureus enterococci so these are the organism that are responsible. When we talk about the um, diagnosis, so we looked for the WBCs in uh, urine uh, DR or urine detail examination and we will go for the urine culture. So this is the uh, chronic bacterial prostatitis. In case of chronic A bacterial prostatitis, what it is the most common and uh, it, the patient would not have any history of recurrent UTI. And clinically, uh, uh, picture is that the patient is, uh, the urine culture shows no bacteria, but the patient is continuously suffering from uh, prostatitis. So there are a lot of other organisms other than bacteria that can cause uh, prostatitis like uh, um, ureo, uroplasm, urealiticum, mycoplasma hominis. These are the, uh, some protozoas are also responsible for causing this um, chronic a bacterial uh, prostatitis like chlamydia trichomatis so these the, the organisms are not the bacteria so they are responsible for this a chronic cro uh, chronic a bacterial prostatitis in case of granulomatous uh, prostatitis there are a lot of condition like in tuberculosis if the person is already suffering from tuber tuberculosis and is getting prostatitis so it could be granulomatous prostatitis if the person is having prostatitis due to um, some fungi due to some uh, mycotic fungi so it will also cause some sometimes post biopsy granuloma it causes prostatitis sometimes allergic condition that causes granulomatous prostatitis and sometimes Calculi and amyloids, amyloidosis. Amyloid is a great um, gelatinous material that also causes granulomatous prostatitis. So all these are the different inflammatory conditions that are associated with the prostate uh, pathology. Now moving towards the hyperplasia. Basically, uh, we in this uh, um, hyperplasia we'll talk about benign enlargement that is nodular hyperplasia usually nodules are uh, appear in periurethral gland as i have told you in the beginning that uh, the uh, prostate is divided into uh, different zones and different lobes so there are nodules that does that are appears in periurethral glands and usually the, the person is um, more than 50 years of age and the hyperplasia the important is thing that the hyperplasia uh, covers stroma and the epithelial cells basically the histology of the prostate shows that it is consisting of fenestromal 
uh, area and the epithelial cell. It is uh, usually more, uh, incidence is more with the advanced age group and it has got no direct correlation with any uh, cancer or any um, uh, any other cancers like adenocarcinoma or different cancers. So what? how can we define this uh, nodular hyperplasia? It is non-cancerous, but the size is increased. It, is, it includes a hyperplasia of the prostate, stromal, and epithelial cell. And the important thing that it results in nodules in transitional zones of prostate. So the uh, very important thing is that you should know that which zone or which lobe is associated with to specific type of pathology. In case of hyperplasia, we, uh, it is associated with the transitional zone. But when we talk about um, the carcinoma of the prostate, it will not associate it. Uh, the percentage of uh, involvement of the transitional zone is not that much high. So what, what happens when there is a hyperplasia? It pushes the urethra and get it narrowed that results in resistance in or obstruction in the flow of urine from the bladder. So this is basically the definition, or you can say that the basic understanding of benign nodular hyperplasia. Okay, so what are the different causes of uh, BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia? The Causes are associated with the hormones that is elevated estrogen level, smoking, reduced activity. The person uh, is having the sedentary lifestyle. The person is immobile, and there there is no exercise or there is no activity associated. And it is also associated with the intake of Western diet. Western diet means that. There is low fiber in the diet. Like uh, nowadays, uh, people are more towards having junk food. So there is no fiber in that diet. So that leads to that could lead to the uh, one of the reason of benign prostatic hypertrophy. So here you can see that is a normal prostate. It is very it is normal sign that is twenty grams. But in case of enlarged prostate or the benign prostatic hypertrophy, you can see the size is a bigger. The size is bigger, and the opening of urethra is getting narrowed as compared into this normal anatomical picture. So you can well appreciate it. What are the physiological changes occurs uh, during this uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy urethra get narrowed here and what happens that obstruct the flow of urine from the bladder through the urethra so it will cause obstruction of urine that eventually put back pressure on the bladder and sometimes what happens that due to the accumulation of urine, there is a hypertrophy of bladder as well. But this occurs in case of uh, prolonged and constant accumulation of urine inside the bladder. So in this uh, histological picture, you can well appreciate the histology of the prostate and it will be very helpful in understanding the carcinoma of the prostate. So in these are the these are the glands and they are these these are the these are the glands and this is the papillary infolding like the glands are moving inside uh, inside and form a papillary or you can say villi like projections here the gla glands normal uh, in normal conditions the glands are lined by two types of cells that is the basal cell uh, which is uh, columnar epithelium and the outer are the cuboidal cells. Then here is corpora amylacea. Corpora amylacea basically is an accumulation of hyalinaceous material and it is also found in um, brain and in lungs as well. 
and here is the fibromuscular stroma. So you can see that there is epithelial lining which is covering the gland and this is the fibromuscular stroma. By understanding the histological picture, you can better understand the pathogenesis of BPH. So you should have a clear idea of what are the stroma or the fibromuscular stroma and what are the different glands. This is the basal layer and this is the basal layer uh, consisting of a columnar epithelium and the outer layer is the cuboidal epithelium. In case of carcinoma, what happens? This basal layer is completely el eliminated. There is no basal layer in case of carcinoma of the prostate. So you should know the histology as well. So this is the pathogenesis. It is very interesting that how that um, um, hypertrophy of the prostate occurs. Actually, uh, this testosterone that produces DHT, that is dihydrotestosterone from testis with, under the activity of 5-alpha reductase type 2. This 5-alpha reductase type 2 is only present in the stromal cell. Back like these 5 alpha reductase type 2 is found in these cells. It is not found in this epithelial lining of the gland. So, what happens that uh, uh, there are two types of 5 alpha reductase type 1 and type 2. Type 2 is found uh, here in the stromal cells, whereas the type one is found in the liver and skin cells. So we are not concerned with type 1. We are concerned with this uh, type 2. Okay, so what happens that this uh, uh, dihydrotestosterone, they attached to the nuclear androgenic receptors in the stroma and they are they are linked with the different growth factors the growth factors what they what happens when they attach to the androgen receptors there is a transcription of uh, several growth factors and they and most important are the transforming growth factors and fibroblast growth factor family so here are the these are the growth factors receptors and these are the growth factors. So basically fibroblast growth factor family is found in the, is produced by the stromal cell. So this is the way how uh, this testosterone produced DHT, dihydrotestosterone and this uh, dihydrotestosterone, uh, they linked with the receptors and um, causes trans uh, trans of several growth factors and these are the two important growth factors. Whereas in case of uh, epithelial lining, what happens that this 5-alpha uh, rectase type 2 is not present. So this DH2 directly uh, linked with the androgenic receptors. This is These are the and, uh, androgenic receptors and these receptors they cause transcription of the several growth factors. And again, these growth factors then linked with their receptors to perform further activity. Okay. When we talk about uh, the clinical presentation, initially it is asymptomatic, but uh, we have divided this clinical presentation uh, into three types, like the storage symptoms, like a person is having urgency, that is having emergency of passing out urine, increased frequency, nocturia, and urinary incontinence. In voiding symptoms, there is reduced flow and feeling of incomplete, empty, empty, and then there's a post-void dribbling, like there's a dribbling of urine if the person has already uh, voided the urine. So this is this is the these are the clinical presentation or the clinical course of the uh, bph when we talk about 
the complication, the one more important complication is obstructive uropathy. As we are already studying obstructive uropathy, which has got uh, three conditions of positive. So one of the most important com uh, complication is obstructive uropathy. And due to the back pressure, I have told you that there is a bladder hypertrophy then what happens sometimes the diverticular formation occurs in case you, you, you see that here due to the hypertrophy of the uh, bladder, the bladder forming a diverticulum, that there is small pouch that, uh, that is uh, moving laterally from the wall of the bladder. Why, why this happens? Because due to the compression of the urethra, there is a generation of pressure inside the bladder. And when the bladder is ballooned up, it causes the verticulums. Then again, the back pressure causes bilateral hydrourethra. Again, the urethra become enlarges in size. Then it leads to the bilateral hydronephrosis, as we have discussed in uh, my last class then there is a formation of stones and due to the hydronephrosis what happens there is a black pressure on the kidneys the kidneys get it profit and the there is a complete obliteration of the normal um, concentrating mechanism of the uh, urine that is performed by the kidney then that further leads to the infection septicemic conditions or the formation of calculi but always remember that there is no risk of development of carcinoma of prostate if the person is already having a, a benign prostatic hypertrophy so the thing is that how we manage this uh, condition the, there should be a lifestyle changes like uh, if the person is having uh, um, BPH to increase fluid intake should be prohibited. There should not be uh, increased fluid intake. Increased fluid intake should be prohibited. Alpha blockers basically are muscle relaxants. So in case of medication what happens that the alpha blockers are um, the choice of therapy then uh, five alpha reductase inhibitors uh, what they do they uh, five alpha reductase inhibit they inhibit the uh, formation of uh, dihydrotestosterone so in this way we can stop the activity of the androgen and in case if we need to go for the surgery there is transurethral resection of prostate has been the gold standard, uh, especially when we are talking about reducing the symptoms and uh, flow, uh, improving the flow of urine. So it is basically, uh, the uh, we have two types of management that is the conservative management in which we have to change the lifestyle. We inhibit, in discourage to take increase amount of fluid then we will go alpha blockers which is a which which is muscle relaxant so it is very helpful uh, basically what they do they alpha blockers they inhibit uh, the activity of alpha adren adrenergic receptors another we go for um, alpha reductase inhibitors in order to inhibit the activity of uh, DHT and if the, if the position is so much worse that we need surgery, then we will go for transurethral resection of the prostate. Here, there are different types of um, um, surgical interventions are suggested like transurethral microwave thermotherapy, transurethral needle ablation, laser prostatectomy, photo vaporization, interstitial laser coagulation, and intraprostatic urethral stents. In transurethral, we will just giving you the introduction. We are not going into the details. We just know that what happens in the transurethral microwave ther uh, thermotherapy, uh, it involves the waves directly to the prostate 
through a transurethral probe to raise the temperature of the prostate tissue so that this uh, uh, heat causes death of tissues. So the death of the extra tissues or the hypertrophic tissues, so it will release the symptoms of uh, obstruction. In case of trans transurethral needle ablation, uh, again, the temperature of the prostate tissue get increases and it, it will cause localized necrosis. That what, what happens in the necrosis, the oxygen supply is completely disrupted. And that, uh, after that, what happens, the tissue uh, will get die due to the deficiency of the oxygen. In case of laser prostatectomy, it is the use of uh, ultrasound guided uh, technique. So what happens, it, the laser beam developed into the transurethral through an instrument for coagulation and vaporization of the prostatic tissue. So you can see that in all these uh, invasive procedure, what we are going to do that we are cutting down the hypertrophic or extra prostatic tissue so that we can clear the obstruction of urethra and allow the normal flow of urine, which is uh, 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 obstructed due to the hypertrophy of the tissues and muscles. In photo vaporization, what happens that uh, here is a high power laser light used to vaporize uh, prostatic tissues. Interstitial laser coagulation is uh, a laser is used to treat the area by a placement of light guided directly into the prostatic tissue. Like again, in, in that, in that the, the tissue is uh, burned through the laser. Intraprostatic urethral stents, sometimes what happens when all these techniques are not successful, there is a permanent stent is inserted inside the urethra to, to make the flow of urine uh, more comf comfortably and easily. But this stent could lead to chronic infection and uh, pain. So this is a trans urethral resection of the prostate. So you can see that what happens that before, before a TERP, there's a prostatic tissue that is so much uh, larger in size. But after that, what happens? After the incisions, the tissue is in normal, normal in size. This is open prostatectomy. But in all these uh, conditions, the treatment or the gold standard in terms of reducing is transurethral resection of the prostate or TERP. Now we are moving towards the third most important condition of prostatitis is prostatic carcinoma. Well, prostatic carcinoma is one of the most uh, important and common uh, uh, carcinoma in males. And uh, it is uh, usually found in 70% of the cancers is found in peripheral zone. And uh, it is most common in uh, um, USA and it is most common above the age of 50 years. It is uncommon in Asian countries and high incidence are found in blacks and uh, in which we can see the prostate intraprethelial neoplasia. Etiology basically uh, involves the environmental factors like uh, if the person, usually it is saying that a person who is taking uh, um, uh, taking meals low in lycopenes. Lycopenes is very important substance found in tomatoes and soya beans. Or, is, or the person is having high fat diet, so the probability of uh, developing this um, carcinoma is high. 
then the family history is very important in fact when we talk about the family history it is uh, uh, divided into certain genetic for the genetic so association that we will discuss in hereditary factors in in when we talk about the genetic factors that is uh, divided into the inherited polymorphism epigenetic alterations and the somatic mutation in case of uh, uh, as we talk about the diet the diet rich in meat is more prone to develop cancer but all these are the uh, probabilities it is they are not 100% the uh, hard and fast rule racial factors i told you that they are uncommon in asians they are more common in uh, blacks and one thing that we should all know that there is no viral origin there is no association with cigarette smoking like or alcohol taking or uh, any height weight and physical activity or any uh, it is not associated with any blood group so you should know because some of the cancers are associated with the blood group <laughs> pathology when we talk about the pathology 95 percent of uh, prostatic carcinomas are adenocarcinoma and rest of them are small cell carcinoma mucinous carcinoma endometroids transitional cells, squamous, and other carcinomas. So before going into the pathology, I just want to again show the normal histology of the prostate. So you can well understand the difference between the changes that occurs in, in, in cancerous condition. So this is the normal histology. These are the cuboidal epithelium, as I have showed you. The glands are lined with uh, basal cell layer that is columnar cells and the upper one is the cuboidal cell these are the connective tissues these are the intraluminal secretions that is uh, accumulated inside the lumen of the glands and the these are the again these are the prostatic alveoli or the glands so just look at this picture this is the prostatic carcinoma morphology so what happens that in case of prostatic carcinoma, there is complete obliteration of basal cell layer. You can see here, there is a basal cell, uh, basal cell layer, and this is the cuboidal lining, and these are the columnar lining. But here is, these are the cancer cells, so there is complete distortion of the architecture of the epithelial cell linings, there is no demarcation. There is absence of basal layer that is showing with this red stain. So I hope you have got some idea about uh, the Uh, morphological features so what happens where uh, we divided it uh, into well differentiated when the glandular pattern is well differentiated and uh, uh, what happens that uh, there is complete um, loss of ratio of uh, nucleus and the cytoplasm as you have seen in this this uh, um, cancer cells that you cannot identify a complete specific ratio of uh, a nucleus and uh, cytoplasm. There's com there is absent of basal cell layer and you can see that the back-to-back -back arrangement uh, uh, of the cells is also, is also lost, right? And there's a, there is less differentiated variance cell to grow in sheets, nets, and cords. Okay, when you talk about the pathogenesis uh, of uh, this uh, prostatic carcinoma, so androgens play 
very important role. They bind to the androgen receptors. And after binding to the andro androgenic receptors, there are changes like phosphorylation of uh, receptors takes place that allow this uh, androgen receptor complex to move inside the nucleus. What happens when they move in the nucleus? They bind to the androgen response elements that promotes transcription of androgen responsible genes. And those genes, they control growth, apoptosis, and differentiation. So what happens when there is excessive amount of androgens are produced? So the, these androgen responsive genes becomes uh, not regulated and they will uh, promote no differentiation of cells and they will cause uh, sometimes apoptosis and they have lost the control of the growth of the normal cell. So what happens that all these changes, they uh, will eventually cause the formation of these cancer cells. Sometimes what happens that uh, when we talk about the, okay. So clinical manifestation in, in cases of early stages, the cancers, this cancer is totally asymptomatic and it is always found in the, more found in the peripheral zone. But as it gets advanced, it causes different uh, urinary symptoms like obstructive hesitancy, intermittent, intermittent uh, uh, urinary symptoms and retention of urine, hematuria, renal failure and the pelvic pain. When we talk about the mats, the very important mats that uh, uh, found is bone in bone that is osteoblasts formation, which it, uh, eventually causes bone pain. Then spinal cord compression, paraphrasis, and uh, when it spreads through the regional uh, pelvic lymph nodes, it causes pelvic and peridinal painful conditions and edematous lower extremities. Grading of first C is very important and we go for the Gleason scale. Gleason scale is divided, basically is broadly divided into five categories, which is uh, according to the size and uh, um, shape of the glands. In grade one, which is well differentiated, that is small and uniform glands. Then the, in grade two, they are more widely spaced and grade three, that there's infiltrations of cells, then in grade four, there are irregular masses. And then in case of poorly differentiated grade, um, grade five, there's complete loss of glands and sheets of cells. So these are the uh, important grading scales. Again, what, what, uh, what, what we have to do is that the grading pattern of Gleason on the basis of Gleason scale is divided into dominant and secondary pattern. So if two patterns, if two types of uh, cell are found, one is called the dominant and the one is called the secondary. Obviously dominants are those cells which are more in number as compared to the secondary. And when we are going for the grading, what we do that we uh, add up those dominant and secondary cells. So uh, on the basis of a scoring, score two and four falls under the category of benign. Then six to seven is a treatable condition and more than eight is advanced cancers. So it is, this is, it is the way that uh, how it is grading. You can see the staging of cancer. In, in, in this case, we have four uh, criteria, microscopic, macroscopic, extra capsular, and metatastic. In case of microscopic, what happens? The condition is focus or diffuse. In case of macroscopic, one lobe is involved that is less than 1.5 centimeters and 
both lobes if involved then greater than 1.5 cm in case of extra capsular uh, the weight would be less than 70 grams but it is localized but if the weight is more than 70 grams it is not localized uh, to the prostate but again it is fixed to the pelvic wall like it, it has been it has started spreading in case of mats it is confined to the pelvis d1 and in case of d2 what happens that the, that is uh, the mats has reached away from the pelvis it reached to any parts of the body so this is the staging criteria so one other one is great grading criteria other one is staging criteria when we talk about uh, further in the staging criteria of prostate cancer, we use uh, T and M system, T for tumor, N for uh, lymph node, and M for mats. T for size of the tumor, and for uh, lymph nodes, L, M for mats. So in case of primary tumor, what we are do there are the certain clinical condition that TX primary tumors cannot be assessed, TUMA, no evidence of primary tumor. With T1, inapparent primary tumor, it is not palpable. Here, T1A, in case of T1A, histological findings in five person, T1B, in more than five person, histological tumor would be found in histologically in more than five percent of the tissue. Then T1C, tumor identified by needle biopsy. T2, tumor confined with prostate, then one half, T2A, then uh, one half of one loop involved. T2B, more than one half, T2, three. So these are the different uh, criteria that is formed according to the nature, size, involvement of limb nodes, involvement of the other organs of a tumor. So this basically staging and grading of uh, any tumor is very important for the treatment point of view. Because uh, we have to decide the treatment, different treatment strategies according to the stage of the tumor. Because all the stages of uh, tumors are not susceptible to single uh, type of treatment plan every stage has to be treated according uh, according to the uh, severity and according to the modality of the tumor so when we talk about the regional lymph nodes nx is regional lymph nodes were not found and no regional lymph nodes mats and one mats in regional lymph nodes. distant mats may m1 no distant mats m1 distant mats M1A, no regional lymph nodes, mats, and M1B, bones, and MC, other sites, without, with or without bones. So these are the different criteria of staging of uh, prostatic CA. So when you go for the diagnostic work, work up, what we will do that uh, Initially, we will go for the conservative diagnostic work or we will go for the complete blood count, complete blood chemistry. Then we will look for the PSA, that is the um, one of the most important prostate, speci prostate specific antigen. Then plasma acid phosphatases. Then we go for the trans uh, in radiological imaging, that is transrectal ultrasounds, biopsy, chest x-ray, CT, radioisotopes, bone stand, MRI, and PET scans or PETs in high cases. So according to the sign of symptoms, digital rectal examination is also very important and it is used to do in very early uh, conditions. Although it is not correlated very good with the volume and the extent or with the diagnosis of the uh, cancer, but it is one of the integral part. Uh, the serum uh, prostate that is prostate specific antigens, so that is again, it is in, uh, uh, released. These are the serine proteas and uh, they usually 
uh, has a specific value which is greater than four nanogram per ml. So they they can be uh, linked with the uh, diagnosis of cancer, but they are not hundred percently linked with the diagnosis of cancer because serum PSA level also increases in some normal conditions. So it is not. Uh, you can say that it's very specific and sensitive along with the diagnosis. But yes, we are taken into account. So when we talk about the serum PSA, uh, we have uh, um, we look for the PSA density, that is the volume value, uh, serum PSA value and divided by the gland volume. Then we go for the uh, uh, PSA velocity, that is the rate of change of PSA value. So all these are associated. When the value of this, uh, uh, when this the value is higher, is getting higher, so it will become more uh, like you can say that. Uh, it shows the um, gravity or the uh, more uh, like show the that the gland is not working well. It shows the gravity, grave condition of the gland. So then we will go for the truss guided biopsy. Uh, this is one of the very important course, but uh, the. Um, it is very helpful in developing the diagnosis and it can also tell us know, tell us about the grade of the cancer, that how much the cancer has been uh, uh, extended or mats has been developed. So when we talk about the uh, diagnosis, we have uh, morphological changes on biopsy, like the architecture, cytology, and the ancillary findings, absence of uh, basal cell, uh, there and increased in alpha methyl acyl coenzyme. So these are the three very important uh, aspects which we cannot ignore while diagnosing the cancer. I have talked about the serum PSA that it is a protein. It is it is not very specific. It is it is also produced by the normal tissues as well and uh, we look for the ratio of free and bound PSA levels in the blood. Genes that are responsible as biomarkers for the carcinoma are urinary PCA3 and combination of urinary PCA3 and TMPRSS2 ERG fusion DNA. So these are the genes that can be detected in diagnosing of the um, prostatic seal. Some other uh, important uh, mutations that are also associated of uh, tumors uh, of this uh, prostatic CA are the tumor suppressor gene, BRCA2, germline mutation gene in HOXP13. Then there are some structural genetic changes in prostate cancers, chromosomal rearrangement, then uh, genetic alteration of 8Q24 locus containing MYC oncogene and uh, deletion of PTE and tumor suppressant gene. So these, you should just have an idea that what are the genes, what are the um, deletion, deletion and uh, what are the genetic alterations are associated with this prostatic carcinoma. When we talk about that, Actually, these are the these I have uh, talked earlier in the lecture that uh, we divided the genetic conditions into three: that is, polymorphism, epigenetic, and somatic changes. So you should know that which genes are involved in developing this cancer. When we talk about the treatment, there is uh, a different uh, line of treatments like anti-androgen plus chemotherapy. Chemotherapy alone is not successful, but uh, 
combination with anti-androgen has good beneficial effects. In case of surgery, there is radical prostatectomy and phallic lymph adenectomy. Then we go for external beam radiotherapy in case of radiotherapy and cryosurgery. Now, now, nowadays, cryosurgery is also getting popular because it uh, coagulates the um, part of that uh, area of prostate that having carcinoma. So these are the references I have taken in making this lecture. And these are uh, all our uh, latest papers. And if you have time, you just go through it. Thank you. Please ask any question. Okay, the question is that uh, how we manage general body hydration with decreased fluid intake. Actually, when we talk about uh, the BPH, I, in BPH, I have asked that uh, fluid intake should be uh, restricted. So this is a calculated amount of fluid that should be restricted. And it is not up to you that uh, if a person is suffering from uh, um, uh, BPH, so it is not necessary that he will stop intake of fluid by himself or herself. Actually, it is advised by the uh, doctor so that a sub, uh, uh, calculated amount of fluid he can take that would be sufficient for the hydration of the body. Estrogen is a part of androgen. So it could be elevated in males. Any other question? Questions are a big name for Skibata. Mapper, okay, which uh, slide you want? know Sayyid Zain Ali Shah you are asking for some slide which slide can you mention that slide so I can go back to that slide Hello, any further question? Any question? Please refer which slide you are talking about. Any question? <laughs> 